All right, so this differential equation, dy dx equals e dx over y root one plus y squared, um, clearly is a separable differential equation because we got a function in terms of x, that's the e to the x. And we got a function in terms of y, that's the y or the one over y root one plus y squared. And so all we need to do is separate the variables and then integrate each side. So uh, we'll multiply by dx to bring the dx over and we'll multiply by y root one plus y squared to bring that to the left-hand side. So this should immediately become y root one plus y squared dy equals e to the x dx. Everybody good with that first step there? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So then we integrate both sides and integrating the left side should be very easy, right? The integral of e to the x is just e to the x plus one constant. And then this one, y root one plus y squared requires us to use a u substitution. So we'll let u equal one plus y squared and du will be two y dy. So we'll have to put in a two and a one half. And so we end up with one half the integral of my two y dy becomes du and I have root u. So we'll call that u to the one half du. Everybody good there? Yeah. Okay. And then um, we'll integrate the u to the one half that becomes u to the three halves divided by three halves. So two thirds u to the three halves. If we multiply that by the one half, that should be one third u to the three halves <laughs> equals e to the x plus a constant. And we need to solve for y. We don't have a y, so we need to replace that u with one plus y squared. So we'll have one plus y squared to the three halves over three equals e to the x plus c. Everybody good with that so far? Yeah. Okay, we'll have to multiply by three, which will give us one plus y squared to the three halves equals three e to the x plus that constant times three. And I'm going to write three C there rather than just writing C, because now I've taken this specific constant that I've called C and multiplied it by three. So it's three times the original constant. Um, and then we need to just sort of undo all of this one plus y squared to the three halves to get it to just be y. So if we want to get rid of a power of three halves, we have to cube root it and square it. So raise it to the two thirds power. So that would give us one plus y squared equals three e to the x plus three c to the two thirds. We'll need to subtract one. And we'll have to square root. And normally when we square root, right, we get a plus or minus. So we'll do that. And we'll note just sort of to ourselves, we'll note that if there was an initial condition to this, you know, x equals seven, y equals three, and I'm sure that doesn't come out right, obviously, but something like that, we'd plug in the x and the y and determine if we needed the positive or the negative for it. We'd only use one or the other. Um, so if your y value comes out to be a positive number, then you want the positive squared. And if your y value is a negative number, you want the negative squared. But since this is just a general solution, this is good enough for us. Good or no? Yeah. Nobody's you. got any questions there? Everyone's good. That makes questions? sense. Cool. All right. All right. And the other one was 2D. Is that correct? Yeah. All right. And what was 2D? That was dy dx equals something again equals 4x cubed tangent y when y equals pi over 2 and x equals 1. Sorry, y equals what? Pi over 2. Pi over 2. x equals 1. Yeah. All right. So um, once again, dy dx equals a function in terms of x times a function in terms of y tells us this is a separable differential equation. 
So we'll have dy over tangent y equals 4x cubed dx. And dy over tangent y, um, we don't have a rule for integrating that, but we could rewrite that as cotangent y dy. And what's the integral of 4x cubed dx? x to the fourth plus c. x to the fourth plus c, good. And then, um, I guess really I should put my integral signs on here now. I haven't integrated the left yet, so I still have integral with cotangent y dy. And you can either use a u substitution to integrate cotangent y, or, um, you know, we've proved that one in class, so you either memorize it or you got to write it as cosine over sine, let u equal sine, and then find your antiderivative. So what does that come out to be? Should be natural log absolute value of sine x, right? Equals x to the fourth plus c. Sine y. What? It would be it would be sine y because we. Um, oh, sorry, sine y. Integrated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, that's just me being in the bad habit of always using x. Yeah, sorry. Natural log absolute value sine y equals x to the fourth plus c. Good. Any issues there so far? Everybody gets it's good. Okay. And now we'll use our initial condition that when y is pi over 2, x is 1. So this is now natural log absolute value sine pi over 2 is equal to 1 to the fourth or 1 plus c. And what's the sine of pi over 2? 1. one. Zero. Yeah. So natural one, log sir. of 1. So yeah. So sine of pi over 2 is 1. So natural log of 1 is 0. So we get zero equals one plus C or C equals negative one. And so we'll take that and call this now natural log absolute value sine Y is equal to X to the fourth minus one. Everybody good with that up to that point? Yeah. Okay, now we just need to undo all of this, solve for Y. So first off, um, exponentiate it which will just give us absolute value sine y is equal to e to the x to the fourth minus one. And then we need to get a positive or a negative on here, right? To clear off the absolute value. Um, so if we put a positive or negative over here, well, what do we know? about this sine of y value. When I plug in y as pi over two, I better get a positive value over here. True? That sine of pi over two is one. So I get a positive one over here. So that when I plug in x equals one, I better get one, not negative one. So I better use the positive one. Right, so I'm gonna make a note of that. Choose positive because of the initial condition. And so now we've got sine y is equal to just e to the x to the fourth minus one. And y is equal to the inverse sine of e to the x to the fourth minus one. Everybody good with that uh, up till there? Yeah. Okay. And then we still do, though, need to find the interval on which this is valid, which will require us first off to figure out what the domain of this thing is, which is not the easiest. It's not that bad. But... So we've got the inverse sine of e to the x to the fourth minus one. Um, what do we know about inverse sine? What numbers can you plug into an inverse sine function? Between one and negative one. Exactly. So this thing in between here, or within the argument of my inverse sine, has to be between one and negative one, inclusive. We can include negative one and one. Um, and then how do we clear off the e to the power? What do we have to do to everything? Natural log. Take a natural log of everything. So I can't take the natural log of a negative. And so everything over here, 
um, when I try to take the natural log of it, just becomes sort of pointless and no longer necessary because I can't take the natural log of this. And so e to the x to the fourth minus one is never going to be negative, right? E to a power is always going to be positive, right? So really, this is greater than or equal to zero. And so what we then are looking at is that uh, x to the fourth minus one has to be less than or equal to the natural log of one, which is zero. Okay. And that should be a fairly easy inequality for us to solve. X to the fourth is less than or equal to one, which tells us that X is less than or equal to one or greater than or equal to negative one. Right? The only way to get something um, within here, no, well, should be a little more careful with this, is X to the second is less than or equal to one. And that gives us um, greater than or equal to negative one, which still is between there, which gives us x squared is less than or equal to one, which gives us x has to be between negative one and one. And there's no discontinuities in there. Um, it's just x is between negative one and one, so that's our interval on which it's valid, which is the entire domain of that function that we got out in the beginning. Does that make sense or now? Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Any other questions on any of the separable differential equations, homework or problems? Or um, yeah, for two e, there was like something I was looking at. Um, like at the very last step, uh, you took the y squared and then you like cancel that out. Like, how did you know that um, it was only going to be the negative solution, not the positive? Ah. Uh -huh. Um, do you want me to go through the whole thing or just that last little bit? Yeah, just that last little bit because I got the same answer otherwise. Okay, so what did I have going on? I had, what, what was the original differential equation just to have it out there? Um, it was 2x plus secant squared x all over 2i. Okay. And that's the, and what was the initial condition? Uh, it was 0, comma, negative 5. 0, negative 5. Okay. All right. So you went through and you got something like y squared equals x squared plus tangent x. Does that sound right? And then you plugged in your, your stuff, your zero and your negative five, and you found out that your constant was, um, sorry, plus, yeah, plus a c here. And you found out that your constant was 25. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I'm just trying to quickly work through it in my head and then you got you got this y equals plus or minus the square root of this right yeah and you had to decide whether it was the positive or the negative square that's what you're asking about yeah yeah okay cool so you got to go back to your initial condition here and you say all right well when x is zero i need to get out a y value of negative five so negative five needs to equal well, it's either the positive or the negative square root of zero plus zero plus 25. Well, that tells us it's got to be the negative square because I got to get a negative five as my value. Oh, so okay. that's my that makes sense. negative root x squared plus 10x plus 25. Good, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. Yep, no problem. Any other questions from? The homework last night. How did you like find the domain for that to like restrict the? Yeah, so for this one, you have to use a calculator for it. I think I, I thought I mentioned that in class. I know I mentioned it in one of the two AB classes. I might have forgot to say it in this one. Um, it requires a calculator. All I did was um, said that the thing inside of there, x squared plus tangent x plus twenty five, has got to be greater than or equal to zero, right? And so I just. Um, I looked at the graph of x squared plus tangent x plus 25 and looked to see when it was greater than or equal to zero and then found the values when it was, you know, including x equals zero. So like I could show you on, I, I could show you on Desmos real quick. Um, maybe I could. Can you go over to C for the homework? Yeah, once I once I finish, yeah, sure. Thank you. so it's x squared plus twenty or plus tangent x plus twenty five, right? And so I said, all right, well, that's got 
all kinds of annoying asymptotes in there um, at pi over two values though at x equals pi over two. And so I said, well, I need it to be greater than zero. And so I said, well, where does it cross through? So there's my, um, it crosses through at negative 1.534 and it goes up to pi over two it would be the end of that interval where it then jumps back below at that next asymptote. So I just looked at the calculator and had it solve it for me because that's not a function that you're going to be able to figure out when when it's greater than or equal to zero. Does that make sense or no? Yeah. Okay. And I won't have you do that on the test or on the quiz coming up. They'll all be fairly straightforward to evaluate. All right, somebody was asking for 2C. What was 2C? So 2C is dy dx is equal to uh, 4 root y. Oh, wait, actually, hold on. Give me All right, so it's uh, yeah, dy dx is equal to 4 root y ln x over x. All right, say that again. I, I didn't, I couldn't catch that. Uh, four root y. Four root y. Ln x over x. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. A lot of and people y are. Y is equal to one when x is equal to e. Y is one when x is e? Yes. Okay. Oh, so no, when x is e, e, oh, not e. E. Uh, that's a better value. Um, yeah, a couple of people sent me messages asking about this one yesterday. So first off, um, bring your root y over here. So you got dy over root y, and then equals 4 ln x over x dx. So separate your variables. I would rewrite this one as y to the negative 1 half dy. And I would write this one as a u substitution for my integral. So I would note in here that if u is equal to ln x, du is just 1 over x dx. And I have 1 over x dx, and I have u. So this just becomes 4, I'm sorry, the integral of 4 u du. And so the left-hand side, when I integrate that, should become, you know, it goes up to a half, divided by half is 2, y to the 1 half. And then this one becomes 4 u squared over 2, or just 2 u squared plus your constant. Does that make sense so far? Yes. Okay. And so then from there, we got two root what? Well, I guess we'll solve. Yeah, we'll rewrite it with our two natural log of x as u squared plus c. And then we'll uh, evaluate to find our constant. So what do we say? We said y is one, so that gives us two, two times one equals two times natural log of e is one, one squared is still one, so this is just two plus c, giving us a constant of zero. So we've got two root y equals two ln of x squared, and we'll divide by two to get root y equals ln of x squared, and we'll square it to get y equals ln of x to the fourth. Good or no? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Yep, and then um, then you got to find your interval in which it's valid. So the x values, since it's just natural log of x here, have to be greater than zero. Or, you know, x must be greater than zero, and that's the only restriction on this. Other than that, this is this exists for all real numbers. So we can just say for x greater than zero, and that definitely includes x equals e. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Anybody else? Any other questions? All right, if you have any other questions, 
on the separable differential equation homework or on the uh, quiz practice, just send me a reminder sometime today and I'd be happy to answer them for you. Um, so we still got lots of time here. So we're gonna start talking about um, area. And so I know we talked a little bit about, you know, the integral is the area under the curve, but I, was, I kept saying things like, well, that's the case, but there's issues with it, like when the function's below the x-axis and then it's negative and there's a problem. And so we're gonna talk um, a little bit more explicitly about how that area works and how stuff under the x-axis works and what happens when we want to find the area between two curves and, and stuff like that. So that's our goal for today. We're going to get through a few problems here and then we'll finish it up tomorrow after the quiz, leaving us with uh, Friday to tie up any loose ends and maybe talk a bit about volume if we feel like it. So everybody good? Feel like we're ready to get moving with this? Yeah. Spectacular. All right. So we are going to use integrals to find the area underneath a curve, right? And which, as I've mentioned multiple times, I think the area under a curve just means the area between the curve and the x-axis. And so whenever we wanna do this, the first thing we wanna do is at least sketch a graph of our function on the interval we're looking at. And try to note two different things. One, we wanna see if the function is continuous on the interval. Um, and so if there's any discontinuities, we'll have to deal with those. So we'll, those don't pop up as often, but usually if you have a discontinuity, you just integrate up to the discontinuity uh, and then you integrate past the discontinuity as two separate integrals. So not, not really all that big of a deal. Um, the second thing you wanna look for is if there are any X values at which your function crosses through the x-axis. It doesn't matter if it touches the x-axis and bounces off of it. You specifically wanna look for whether it crosses through the x-axis because if it crosses through the x-axis, we'll have to note that any integral, let's say from here, here, the section above, the integral is positive. But in these sections below, when I take the integral, the integral comes out to be negative. And so these have to be done separately so that I integrate from A, let's say, to B and take, the, take that integral and that's this area. Then I integrate from B to C and take the opposite of this integral to find the total area enclosed between the curve and the x-axis from A to C. And because this section below it comes out to be negative. And so if I just integrate from A to C, this will cancel out with some of the area up in the top and we'll get a much smaller value than what the actual area of both regions is. Does that make sense? Yes, no, maybe. Yeah, good. Yeah. All right, cool. So that's our goal. So we'll do that. Anything above, we just integrate as usual. Anything below, we integrate as usual and then take the negative of it, take the opposite of it, and then just add all the areas together. So let's start with a nice, simple, easy one. Let's find the area of the region bounded by the x-axis. x equals 2, x equals 5, and the function f of x equals x squared plus one. So what's the first thing we should do? See if it's continuous. All right, see if it's continuous, right? And, and sketching the graph of it will help us with that, right? x squared plus one we know is a parabola, right? It looks like this, effectively, right? It's got an X, a y-intercept of one, and it's just a regular upward facing parabola. Right? We should generally know what x squared plus one looks like. So we'll ask ourselves the two questions between x equals two and x equals five, are there any discontinuities? No. No. And then we'll ask ourselves, are there any places where it crosses through the x-axis? 
between x equals two and x equals five? No. Sure doesn't look like it, right? So here is the region that we are looking for the area of. All we have to do is integrate from two to five our function. Should be exceptionally easy, right? And what's the integral of x squared plus one? Should be x cubed over three plus x from two to five. And that ought to be 125 thirds plus five minus eight thirds plus two, which gives us what? 125 thirds minus eight thirds, that'll be 117 thirds. And then we got plus five minus two, so plus three, 117 thirds plus three, that'd be 126 thirds, which I think reduces to 42 units squared. Make sure since we're talking area, you write units squared. Any questions on that first one there? I guess that's a no. Let's do another one. So let's find the area of the regions between x squared minus 2x minus 3 and the x-axis from negative 2 to 3. So first off, what should we do? Graph it. Graph it. How do we graph x squared minus 2x minus 3? I know it's got a y-intercept of negative 3, right? That's something. We know it opens up. What else would be helpful to know here? In fact, what's one of the things that I told you to look for? Places where it crosses the x-axis. Crosses through the x-axis. So how do we figure out when x squared minus 2x minus 3 crosses through the x-axis? Find the x-intercepts. Exactly, which we'll do by factoring it. x minus what? x minus 3. And x plus 1 equals 0. So it crosses through at x equals 3 and at x equals negative 1. Actually, I shouldn't have shouldn't put that as my vertex down there at negative 3 because it's not. But we got something that looks about like that. And here's negative two, the beginning of our region. And here's positive three, the end of our region. And what do we notice? We notice that there is a section that is above the x-axis and there is a section that is below the x-axis. True? True. So the section that's above, we just integrate as normal. We just want to find the integral from negative 2 to negative 1 of x squared minus 2x minus 3 dx. And then we need to add to that the opposite of the integral from negative 1 to 3 of the same function. Because the opposite of it will give us this integral as a positive value. Good or no? Good. Perfect. So what's the integral of x squared minus 2x minus 3? Should be x cubed over 3 minus x squared minus 3x. So we got to evaluate that from negative 2 to negative 1. And the plus a negative will turn that into a minus. And then it's the same thing, right? x cubed over 3 minus x squared minus 3x from negative 1 to 3. Good or no? Good. All right. So let's evaluate. We got negative 1 cubed is negative 1 third. We got minus negative 1 squared, should be minus 1. We got plus 3. We got minus 8 thirds, 
sorry, minus negative eight thirds. And then we got a minus four, and then we got a plus six. And then we got minus all of this, plug in the three, that's nine minus nine minus nine minus, plug in the negative one, that should be a negative one third. And we already, we already did this one, right? Negative one third minus one and a plus three. Good or no? Okay. okay. Now for the annoying arithmetic part. So we have a negative a third plus eight thirds, right? Minus a negative eight thirds. So negative one plus eight should be seven thirds. And then we've got minus, minus, minus one third. So we have seven thirds minus a third, which should be two. Right? Six thirds or two, exactly. So we have two. Minus the one should be one, plus the three should be four, minus the negative four should be eight, minus the six should be two. Let's see, nine minus nine minus nine is negative nine. So we had two minus negative nine should be 11. These negatives, right, will cancel each other out. So we have 11 minus one is 10, plus the three should be 13. 13 units squared. So the arithmetic's a little irritating, but hopefully conceptually that's okay. Any issues or questions there? Okay. All right. Let's do this one. Find the area of the regions between sine x, cosine x from zero to pi. This one we might not know exactly what it looks like, but we have, we're going from zero to pi, so that's helpful at least. <clears throat> um, what can we do with this? Or what should we do with it? First off, we need to know if it's continuous. Can you plug everything between zero and pi into sine x times cosine x? Yeah. Yeah, so that's fine. What about places where it goes through the x-axis? How would we figure that out? Finding its x-intercepts. X-intercepts set it equal to zero, right? Sine x, cosine x equals zero. Well, according to the zero product property, right? Something times something is zero. Either one of those things could be zero and then the whole thing is zero. So when does sine x equals zero? At x equals zero and pi. Zero and pi. And when does cosine x equals zero? Pi over two. Pi over two. So zero, pi, and pi over two. And it doesn't really matter if it's crossing through the x-axis at zero and pi, because those are the endpoints, but we do care about here at, uh, at pi over two, whether it's crossing through or not. And so how do we determine if it's crossing through the x-axis or if it's like always above, maybe it's doing something like that, or, Maybe it's doing something like this, right? Or maybe it's doing something like this. What's that? Plug in like uh, pi over four and then three pi over four and see what the values are, like positive or negative. Sounds great. So what is f of pi over four? f of pi over four is root two over two times root two over two, isn't it? Which is positive. So it's up here somewhere. And what about f of three pi over four. That ought to be root two over two times negative root two over two, which ought to be less than zero, which tells us we're down here. And so clearly we've got a section above and a section below. We need to worry about each of them separately. 
right? So we will integrate zero to pi over two of sine x cosine x dx. And we will add to it the opposite of the integral from pi over two to pi of sine x cosine x dx. Good or not good? Good. All right, how do we integrate sine x cosine x? Substitution. Yep, u equals sine x, du equals cosine x dx. And so we have to change our limits of integration, right? Sine of zero is zero. Sine of pi over two is one. Sine becomes u and cosine x dx becomes du. And then over here, we've got plus the negative integral. So we could just call that a minus, right? Sine of pi over two is one, sine of pi is zero. Same thing, u du. And hopefully with any luck, we might notice that our limits are the same here, just in different directions, zero to one and one to zero. But we have a rule that says we can flip the limits of integration, don't we? As long as we flip the sign in front. And now I have the integral from zero to one of u du plus the integral from zero to one of u du, which ought to be two times the integral from zero to one of u du. And if I integrate u du, that ought to be two u squared over two from zero to one, which is one minus zero or one unit squared. Pretty cool, one square unit underneath sine x cosine x from zero to pi, exactly one square unit. Any questions or issues there? Getting the general idea of how to do this? Yeah, makes, makes sense. Wonderful. All right. We will move forward then and talk about what happens if we want to find the area between two curves. Here is f of x. Here is g of x. I want to know the area between them. from A to B. I want to know that area. So if I were to find the area underneath F and ignore G from A to B, that would include all of this, wouldn't it? In addition to what I already highlighted. And then couldn't I subtract from that the area underneath G, which would be all of this? And I would only be left with the section between F and G that I need. True? Or no? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, hopefully so. So um, the question then becomes what happens if, let's say, F is up here, but G is down here? Do I have to deal with opposites of this G function because it's below and all of that? Hopefully not, right? What does the area from A to B of this look like? It looks like all of this space right here, yeah? I'm gonna call it the red, the top in red and the bottom in blue. It's all of that, it's the red and the blue. Um, if I were to just integrate f, that would give me the section in just red, right? True. And then if I were to yeah. subtract the integral of g, well, the integral of g is negative, right? 
So if I were to subtract that negative value, it would become a positive value. And I would then have the entire area. And so I don't need to do anything special when I'm looking for the area between two functions if one of those functions happens to be below the x-axis. Even if there's an interval on which one of the functions crosses through the x-axis or both of them cross through the x-axis, as long as one of them is always above the other one, the same one is always above the other one, all you have to do is f minus g and integrate it from a to b. Good or no? Good. Okay. And sometimes we do need to worry about when the functions cross through each other, when they might intersect with each other. So if the two functions intersect with each other, where I have something like, um, f and g, and suppose here is a and here is b, where sometimes f is above g and sometimes g is above f, then you have to split it in the middle where they intersect with each other and do each piece separately. Does that make sense? Just like we did with the above or below the x-axis with the single function. Yeah. Cool. Makes sense. Wonderful. All right, so let's see if we can find the area between x squared plus one and negative x squared minus one from x equals zero to x equals one. We'll start off by graphing them both. So x squared plus one and negative x squared minus one. You should know what those graphs look like, I hope. And we're just going from zero to one. So we're just looking for that area right there. Good or no? Mm -hmm. All right. So which function is above the other one? F of g. x is above g. Right, x squared plus 1. And so we need to subtract <laughs> negative x squared minus 1 from that and then integrate from 0 to 1. So we could simplify that down to the integral from 0 to 1 of 2x squared plus 2 dx. And then we just integrate. That should be 2 thirds x cubed plus 2x from 0 to 1 or two thirds plus two minus zero plus zero. Eight thirds units squared. Good or no? Good. Great. All right, let's do another one. What should we do first? Graph it. Great idea. All right. So we know what sine x looks like, right? That's an easy one. Sine x just looks like this, right? And what about secant? squared of x. It looks similar to secant except always positive and steeper. What does secant x look like? All right, let's start with what's the secant of zero? One. One. We'll start here. 
And as we put in larger x values, what happens to this? What does it do as it goes to the right? It gets larger. It gets larger, right? Yeah. In fact, it goes up towards an asymptote at pi over two. <laughs> um, so we could probably see then, and it does the same thing on this other side. And in fact, it does a bunch of these all over the place. But those other ones don't matter. We only care about the ones between zero and pi over four. So secant squared is clearly always above sine of x. So we'll integrate from zero to pi over four. Secant squared x minus sine x dx. And what's the integral of secant squared? Tangent x. Tangent x. Integral of minus sine should be? Cosine. Positive cosine, yep. Yeah. From 0 to 5 over 4. And then we just evaluate tangent pi over 4 is 1, cosine pi over 4 is root 2 over 2, tangent 0 is 0, and cosine 0 is 1. We got 1 plus root 2 over 2 minus 1, which is root 2 over 2 units squared. Good or no? Yeah, good. All right, let's do, uh, let's do at least one more. We got the area of the region enclosed by the parabola y equals 2 minus x squared and y equals negative x. And what is different about this one? There's no interval. There's no interval given to us, right? So we're going to have to figure out the interval on our own. Let's graph functions. 2 minus x squared looks like this, right? And y equals negative x looks something like this. And so we'll note that built into this, we have a singular region that is the intersection of these two functions. And we should be able to figure out where those two functions intersect, and then we'll know our limits of integration. So how do we figure out where two functions intersect? Set them equal to each other. Exactly. So 2 minus x squared equals negative x, or x squared minus x minus 2 equals 0, factor 2, x minus 2x plus 1, and we find that they intersect at 2 and negative 1. So those will be our limits of integration, negative 1 to 2. Which function is the one that's always above the other one on our interval? Minus x squared. Yep, 2 minus x squared minus our negative x dx. And that should integrate to become 2x minus x cubed over 3. This is a plus x, right? So that's plus x squared over 2. And we just got to evaluate from negative 1 to 2, giving us 4 minus 8 thirds plus 2 minus negative two plus one third plus one half. And what does that give us? Four minus two is two plus another two is four. And we got a minus eight thirds minus another third to be minus nine thirds. We have four minus, uh, I think I did that. I think I did some arithmetic wrong there somewhere, didn't I? It should be plus two. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I just didn't write the minus. Oh, I wrote the minus instead of writing a plus. All right, that's better now. I feel better about that. Okay, that's not enough area. Um, sorry, let's do our arithmetic there. 
plus two, because that's plus x squared over two. So we have four plus two is six, plus another two is eight. And then we have the minus eight thirds minus a third is minus nine thirds, or minus three minus a half. So we have five minus a half, which ought to be nine halves units squared. Good, or now any questions on that? So I'm a bit confused because doesn't the doesn't the integral of y equals negative x kind of include that little area below your parabola but above the x-axis? You're talking about right here? Yeah. Um, yes, it does. But since we're integrating, and in fact, it doesn't include, I, I sort of sketched over there, it doesn't include that. We're talking straight down here and straight up here. So technically adding the integral of just negative x includes this um, and, and also this as a negative. But um, we don't have to worry about that because what we're doing is we're taking this function. So we're taking this piece that goes from here to here, all of that, and subtracting from it everything that is underneath this other curve, which includes these. So we're knocking those pieces off when we do it. Does that make sense or no? Yeah, OK. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions on that? All right, that is where we will stop for today.